Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 105. Today's show is yet another installment in our exciting exploration of the physiology of mollusks. In the previous episodes, we looked at the primitive mollusk worms, known as aplacophorans, as well as their slightly more complex mono- and polyplacophoran cousins. Then we spent an episode examining the bivalves, such as the clams and oysters and all their relatives. Today, we'll be moving into some of the more derived groups of mollusks by turning our attention to the slugs and the snails of the clade Gastropoda. The earliest possible ancestors of the vast lineage that would produce, among others, the gastropods, emerged in the oceans sometime in the late Cambrian, around 500 to 485 million years ago. The ocean water in this period, particularly in shallow water habitats, was rich in calcite compounds, which could be consumed by organisms and metabolically transformed into calcium carbonate, which is used to make shells, among other types of hard tissues. By the end of the Ordovician period, around 444 million years ago, the gastropod crown ancestor had emerged and diversified, its descendants adapted to many different ecological niches within the archaic marine biome. By the time of the Carboniferous period, 360 to 300 million years ago, we have evidence that diversifying lineages were spreading out from the ocean into drier, more terrestrial habitats. These primitive gastropods were similar to their monoplacophoran cousins, in the sense that their general body plan consisted of a broad, muscular foot and a single shell plate on their back. However, where the placophorans remained small and tended to stay buried comfortably in the mud of the seafloor, the gastropods chose a more free-roaming lifestyle, actively moving around on the seafloor or swimming in the ocean. Over time, the gastropods grew larger and longer. They took on the more traditional form that you would recognize, with a broad, elongated, limbless body that squirms and slides along, with facial tentacles sensing the area immediately in front of it. In the snails, what was once a simple conical plate along the dorsal surface has diversified into a wide variety of coiling shells, from the small and simple to the large and ornate. The foot and the face and the other soft external tissues all protrude from an opening in the base of the shell. And in most species, if they sensed danger, these soft tissues could be quickly retracted back into the protective confines of the shell. With this unusual, armored, mobile car body form, the gastropods were able to spread out and diversify into a wide range of terrestrial habitats. The ancient slug and snail species evolved to fit into several different ecological niches, most notably as slow-moving predators in a coral reef, herbivorous grazers in forests of kelp and seagrass, and shell-destroying hunters and scavengers in the depths of murky, deep-water trenches. Many of these ancient gastropod lineages would eventually die out across the vast gulfs of time that make up the Mesozoic era, but a small percentage would cling on to life, and they would continue to perpetuate themselves and diversify. The fossil evidence suggests that around this time, the near ancestor of all the modern gastropods emerged. This crown ancestor, or this, this proto-crown ancestor, emerged and then diversified either immediately before or during the Mesozoic era, wherein they coexisted with the dinosaurs. Take a moment to note that the first dinosaurs emerged around 230 to 240 million years ago, in the evolutionary recovery period that followed the Permian-Triassic extinction event. At this point in time, the gastropods, as an entire lineage, you know, the whole thing, going way back, at this point in time, when the, when the dinosaurs were just emerging, the gastropods had already existed for some 
200 to 250 million years. So today, they're basically twice as old as the dinosaurs. During the Cenozoic era, which we're living in right now, and which has been going on for about 66 million years, there was a similar evolutionary recovery period, after the dinosaur-killing mass extinction event caused by the asteroid impact. During and after this prolonged recovery period, many species underwent rapid evolutionary change and diversification, including birds, mammals, bivalves, and of course, the gastropods. The immediate ancestors of modern gastropod species can be identified in these early Cenozoic-era fossils. This period of diversification, which ultimately gave birth to all modern gastropods, was exceptionally fruitful. The number and diversity of gastropods that we see in the world today is immense. It's almost unbelievable. And it's second only to the insects in terms of the raw number of species. Naturally, this also makes the gastropods the most biodiverse clade of mollusks. Out of the estimated quarter million species of mollusk, a third of them, an estimated 85,000 species, are gastropods. This biodiversity is due in part to the fact that unlike all of the mollusks we've talked about so far, and will talk about in the rest of the series, the gastropods are the only mollusk clade with fully terrestrial species. In this regard, they also experience the widest diversity of habitats, of diets, and predators. Take a moment to compare the gastropods in this context to all of the other mollusks. The many types of placophorans, which I covered in the first episode of the series, well, they all live in the muck on the seafloor. The bivalves, which I covered in the previous episode, also live in the muck on the seafloor, and in the intertidal zones, and on rocks and corals and other hard surfaces in the water. The cephalopods, which I'll cover in the next two episodes, are also entirely aquatic. Now, most of the 85,000 gastropod species are also aquatic, but some of them, some 24,000 species of snail and slug, live on land, and they represent the only terrestrial mollusks. In fact, as a clade, the gastropods have adapted to almost every habitat on the planet. There are species of slug and snail that live not just in the coral reefs, in the seagrass meadows, in the riparian zones and wetlands and forests where you might expect them, but also in strange and unexpected habitats, like in the subarctic, where they survive the freezing cold winter season, in the nutrient poor soils of caves and acidic boreal forests, where building a shell can be close to impossible, in scorching hot, arid deserts, where water and biomass is hard to come by even around deep-sea hydrothermal vents, and all manner of other places and biomes. As the gastropods have adapted to such a wide range of habitats, so too have they adapted to a wide range of diets. Now, most gastropods are herbivores. On land, these species eat soft plant parts, like leaves, flowers, fruits, and in some cases, even bark. In the ocean, herbivorous gastropods typically feed on algae, like the stuff they scrape off of rocks on the shallow parts of the seafloor where the sunlight can still penetrate deep enough to power photosynthesis. But many gastropods are also scavengers, and they'll follow chemical cues to track down the soft, decaying corpses of plants and animals alike. Other species prefer their food to be alive, and they've evolved a parasitic lifestyle to exploit some particular species of host. And there's even a small number of active predators among the gastropods, which hunt down live prey. As the gastropods tend to be relatively soft, squishy, and slow, it may seem counterintuitive that some species are active hunting predators. However, in this circumstance, the gastropod species in question has generally adapted to a specific habitat where they can pull it off. For example, there's a few types of slugs that burrow through the soil 
where they can chase after smaller, slower earthworms. So how do you solve the problem of hunting stuff when you move pretty slowly? Well, you just find something that's smaller than you and that moves slower than you, and you hunt that. Problem solved. Other carnivorous gastropods have adapted to hunt and eat smaller gastropods, particularly slugs, as they lack a protective shell, and they're that much more vulnerable. However, even for the snails, the shells don't offer absolute protection, as there's some predators who can drill or punch through the shell of their prey to eat the soft, squishy tissue inside. So the question is, how do they find their prey? The gastropods don't have ears. They don't have a sense of hearing at all. And while they do have eyes, their vision isn't particularly sophisticated. Their vision is only useful for telling them light from dark, about the gross movement of shadows and objects around them. And if they can perceive any detail at all, it would be of the things in the world immediately around them. Now, there's a lot of variety in gastropod eyes. Many of them are just simple spots of photosensitive cells that can barely detect the difference between light and dark. But some species have more complex eyes, some of them even with lenses. However, no matter what their eye structure, their vision just isn't that good. They're largely nocturnal, so they don't really rely on vision anyway, except for maybe observing and tracking the full moon. But who knows? Instead of their sense of sight, they generally depend on their sense of smell. They have sophisticated chemosensory organs, olfactory glands, which can detect chemicals in the air, soil, and water, like the pheromones from a potential mate, the volatiles of edible detritus, and the trace residues, or the scents, of plants and prey. In terrestrial gastropods, for example, these olfactory glands are mounted at the tips of tentacles protruding from the bottom of their face. The upper tentacles, in contrast, mount the eyes, either at the base of the stalk or at the tip. I'll mention again that these terrestrial gastropods tend to be nocturnal, which is really fascinating because it's an example of them adapting to a lifestyle that minimizes the impact of their visual deficits and it maximizes the value of their relatively keen olfactory sense. And moving around at night is generally safer than moving around during the day. So, by predominantly using their sense of smell, the gastropod will track down prey, or food. If they're hunting other gastropods, for example, they can detect certain chemicals in the slime trail that they left behind, and follow that scented trail to their prey. The capture event unfolds in slow motion as the predatory snail moves over its prey snail with their broad, elongated, muscular foot organ and then begins to scrape away at it with their radula. You should remember from earlier episodes that the radula is a bony, tongue-like structure with toothed serrations used for scraping at and breaking down food into particles that are small enough to be consumed and digested. Primitive gastropods, like abalones and limpets, are herbivores that feed on seaweed. They find places where the seaweed is crumpled against or draped over rocks, which allows them to wiggle over and scrape at the loose or crumpled plant tissue with the radula. Many marine gastropods, particularly predators and scavengers, are similar to their bivalve cousins in the sense that they also burrow into the seafloor, and they even possess siphons that they can extend from their shell to protrude above the surface. These siphons allow them to sniff or taste the water around them. They can detect chemical residues that might belong to potential prey, allowing them to approximate the position of their food and time their strikes for a perfect ambush. Once food has been captured in the mouth, it's taken in through the pharynx, which is unusually large in the gastropods, especially the carnivorous gastropods. After being wetted with digestive enzymes secreted by the salivary glands in the pharynx, the food moves through a long esophagus into a curving tube stomach. In herbivorous aquatic gastropods, this stomach has evolved into a kind of gizzard 
which uses ingested sand grains and a tough, heavily textured, cuticle-covered inner surface to mechanically grind up the plant food. The gastropod's stomach is usually positioned near the midsection or the posterior of the animal. In the terrestrial snails, for example, the stomach is lifted up into the rear of the shell, along with other organs like the kidney, the liver, heart, and, filling up most of the rest of the space, a big lung for breathing in dry air. Well, this is the case, at least, for terrestrial gastropods, which have a single little opening on the right side of their shell, called a pneumostome, for inhalation and exhalation. One group of terrestrial slugs, the Veronicellidae, have evolved to breathe through their skin, and their lung became vestigial, then disappeared. There's also a number of freshwater gastropods that also possess a lung. Some of them only have a lung, so they're forced to come up to the surface periodically to take a breath. In that sense, they're kind of like aquatic reptiles or aquatic mammals. Others have a lung and gills, and they can breathe in any environment, while a smaller number of species have been observed to retain an air bubble in their shell, from which they can get oxygen and a bit of buoyancy, which may help them move faster. A good portion of the marine snails that live in shallow water habitats also have a lung, but the majority of marine species just have gills. In the nudibranch clade, which are a group of charismatic and morphologically unique sea slugs, there are species whose gills take the form of elaborate feathery tufts coming out of the top or the back of their head. In any form the gill takes, the oxygen that gets absorbed is loaded up onto molecules of hemocyanin, which are functionally analogous to hemoglobin in mammals, except hemocyanin uses copper instead of iron. This gives their blood a slight blue color instead of a red color. There are exceptions, of course, such as the ram's horn snails, Planorbidae, which have evolved to use hemoglobin instead of hemocyanin, so they have a more mammal-like red blood color. And there's also a small number of genera that have semi-clear, colorless blood due to a lack of pigments and alternative oxygen transport schemes. Now, coming back to the digestive system, once the food has been broken down in the stomach, it's passed into the intestines, where the nutrients get absorbed. This process is kinda neat, as all gastropods have a little sac, called a style, located at the bottom end of their stomach, opposite the esophagus. This little sac is lined with cilia, which wave around in a circular motion to pull the food along into the digestive tract. You see, the gastropods don't necessarily use peristalsis to move their food through the digestive tract like humans and other vertebrates do. Instead, the food particles are suspended in a gooey, slimy mucus after being chewed up in the mouth. This string of food-coated mucus is dangled into the gastropod's stomach, and it coils up in the style sac. Here, the cilia beat against this coiling string of mucus, pushing it along into the intestines, where nutrients can be absorbed from the embedded food, and water can be reabsorbed from the mucus. As the gastropods have an open circulatory system, all of the absorbed nutrients diffuse through the intestinal wall into a hemolymph-filled cavity, where they can be guided through various sinus chambers to be soaked up by nutrient-hungry tissues, like, for example, the muscles in the foot. The hemocyanin loaded up with oxygen from the lung or the gills also diffuses into the hemolymph, where it subsequently comes into contact with all of the internal tissues and supplies the cells with the oxygen they need for respiration. Now, even though the circulatory system is technically open, there are a few vascular structures to facilitate optimal circulation. The largest structure is a short aorta descending from the heart, which branches into two smaller channels, one supplying the internal visceral mass inside the shell, and the other supplying more external facing tissues, like the head and sensory organs, and of course the foot. As a matter of fact, these two branching arteries 
continue to branch into a series of smaller blood vessels. You might think, well, what the heck? This is just a closed circulatory system. Well, no, not quite, because of the sinus cavities. These are significant open spaces that permeate the internal body structure. The arterioles drain into them, so the flow of large amounts of nutrient and oxygen-rich hemolymph can be directed towards resource-hungry tissues. Hemolymph that's been tapped for resources is drained into venous sinuses that also include excretory organs like nephridia, and then they get circulated through veins back to the lung or the gills, and then to the heart to be pumped back around again. Once digestion is complete, the waste products must be removed. Like most animals, they have nephridia organs that filter out nitrogenous waste from the hemolymph. These waste products from protein recycling are removed in the form of uric acid or ammonia. In some species, there are structures that return waste to the stomach, where it can be secreted into the digestive juices to go through the process a second time. Solid waste and nitrogenous waste from the nephridia are ultimately excreted through the anus. And this brings me to an extremely fascinating aspect of gastropod physiology. The anus is positioned close to, and sometimes almost directly above, the head. But why? In all gastropods, snails and slugs alike, they undergo a process in the larval stage called torsion. First, they develop an asymmetrical muscle in the foot. At some point in larval development, this asymmetrical muscle will flex, rapidly pulling the visceral mass and the mantle up towards the head. Then, during a slower secondary process that happens later, the tissue on the left side of the animal's body will grow at a much greater rate than the tissues on the right side of the body, and this will magnify the torsion effect. In essence, the gastropod body twists itself until the anus is held above the head or the middle section of the body. When we look at the nervous system, most mollusks have a pair of linear nerve cords running through their body, with multiple smaller nerve bridges between them, together creating the rough shape of a ladder with knobbly ganglia at the joints. The torsion process in gastropods twists their nerve cord into a distorted, uneven, figure-eight shape. The asymmetry creates really important physiological differences between the overgrown left side and the constrained right side of the body. On the right side, where growth was diminished, critical organs like gills and kidneys may not exist, as they've been repurposed into other body parts or other body systems, or they've disappeared entirely. For example, some gastropods have evolved to repurpose their right side renal system as part of the reproductive system. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that all of this torsion stuff, all of this twisting and bending, is largely internal. If you walk out in the forest and take a look at some trees, and you find a slug sliming along the bark, or you see it on the ground or something, it might look relatively symmetrical, like a half cylinder with tapering ends. It might look like a really unusual kind of worm or something. But what you don't see is what's going on under the skin. Small clues might give it away, like the single respiratory organ on one side of the body, but underneath the skin, the visceral mass, including all of the soft tissues and the fat and the organs, it's all twisted up. Think of it like a person contorting their body under a thick blanket. Someone nearby may not see any contortion from the outside, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. Scientists aren't quite sure why torsion exists. There are some seemingly obvious downsides, like the fact that the anus ends up excreting wastes near the head and could potentially soil the mouth and sensory organs. But despite this, the trait is seen in all gastropods, so there must be some benefit that we just haven't figured out yet, for certain. One speculative idea is that torsion allows snails to retract their head 
back into their shell. This would not be possible if torsion did not occur. In terrestrial gastropods, torsion might help with ventilation by lifting up the mantle off the ground so that the undulating movements of the foot don't regularly block the opening to the shell. In aquatic gastropods, it's been suggested that this lifting up of the mantle helps to keep it clean by getting it off the ground and angling it so that sediment doesn't build up inside. The shell itself is asymmetrical, so torsion could have perhaps been a way to counterbalance that initial asymmetry. By working to maintain the animal's balance and center of gravity, torsion allows gastropods to grow larger. Another solution to the asymmetrical shell problem is to just evolve to lose the shell. That's what the slugs have done, and the slugs aren't a single monophyletic clade. They're actually a very diverse paraphyletic group. So we can see clearly that gastropods have evolved to lose their shells multiple times. It would appear that ditching the shell entirely is a popular evolutionary option among many terrestrial gastropods. Apparently, it's worth it for many of these species to exchange the protective benefits of the shell for the improved balance and mobility that they can enjoy without it. All right, so where are we? We've just gone through a bunch of stuff. An overview of general gastropod evolutionary history, their adaptation to various habitats and lifestyles, their sensory organs, their diets and the general process of digestion, and the weirdness of torsion. There's a few more aspects of the gastropods left to cover, and I think a good place to start here would be their reproductive strategies. Now before I begin, I want to mention just how absolutely weird and complicated gastropod mating is. I'll do my best to explain it, but honestly, it is the weirdest shit, and I will never do it justice with words alone. If you don't know what this looks like, do an image search for snail mating or slug sex or something. And I take no responsibility for what happens if someone sees this in your search history or what it does to your targeted ads. Regardless, gastropod mating is the most fascinating alien-like interplay that you will probably ever see. The biggest division in the reproductive strategies can be seen in marine versus terrestrial gastropods. Marine gastropods have distinct sexes, male and female, which have specific roles in the context of combining sperm to egg and producing offspring. But in the terrestrial gastropods, it's a bit different. They're all hermaphrodites, and you might have heard their mating behaviors described before as a kind of quasi-combative mating ritual where the loser is literally stabbed by the opponent's penis, impregnated, and then they develop the eggs internally. This is a rather sensationalized description, as their mating behaviors are more tender and mutual, rather than necessarily combative. The whole activity just looks super weird. So let me break down gastropod mating according to marine, freshwater, and terrestrial gastropods, because each group is pretty different and has its fair share of morphological and functional diversity. Now, the marine gastropods, like I said, have distinct sexes. The majority of species exhibit a typical male-female sex dynamic, with males and females each performing distinct roles in the mating process, such as providing sperm or eggs. However, some marine gastropod species are protandrous, meaning that an individual male will transition to female at some point in their life. This is also known as sequential hermaphroditism, as the individual has both sets of sex organs, just not at the same time. They appear in sequence across the animal's lifespan. This can be compared to simultaneous hermaphroditism, where both sets of sex organs exist simultaneously. Now, only a small minority of marine species are sequential hermaphrodites, but this is more common in freshwater species. Some freshwater hermaphrodites will reproduce by self-fertilizing, 
producing a kind of clonal descendant. What's super fascinating is that after a certain number of generations of self-fertilizing, one of the descendants will experience a physiological trigger that obstructs sperm production. This turns them into functional females, only able to reproduce with foreign sperm. This is a pretty amazing mechanism for balancing the ease and convenience of self-fertilization with the need for genetic novelty to maintain a healthy genetic line across multiple generations. In other words, it's a safeguard against the accumulation of deleterious mutations and traits in a clonal lineage. Or to put it another way, it offers a protective effect against clonal inbreeding. In the terrestrial gastropods, almost every species consists of sequential or simultaneous hermaphrodites, and only a small minority have separate sexes. Now, buckle up, because what I'm about to explain is ridiculously weird and complicated, even for what we've gone over so far. This is the structure of the hermaphrodite sex organ, which begins at the gonads deep in the body and extends down through the organ to the genital pore, facing the external environment. In the hermaphrodite sex organs, there's a single hermaphroditic duct that carries both egg and sperm from the gonads into a larger chamber called the spermoviduct. At some point, this spermoviduct splits into two distinct, sex-specific chambers. The sperm will flow into a long, narrow chamber called the epithallus, which packages the sperm into a gooey mass called a spermatophore. The eggs will flow down past a set of mucus glands into the vagina. The vagina descends directly to the genital pore opening. The epiphallus also converges with the vagina right at the genital pore, and in some species, there's a third chamber that converges here as well, a single, small pouch that contains a sharp, knife-like structure coated in mucus, called a love dart. So all of these structures, from the ducts to the hemiphallus and vagina to the, to the love dart, they all lead to the genital pore a single opening on the right side of the body, immediately behind the head. During mating, these genital structures undergo eversion, where they're projected outside the body. They quite literally get turned inside out, spewing and sprawling outwards from the genital pore. The appearance of this tissue is disgusting, but extraordinary, like a weird multi-pronged tentacle that gets spit out and then retracts, like the growth of a slime mold viewed in sped-up time-lapse video. This is where we get to the supposed combative mating of the hermaphrodite gastropods. In any given mating encounter, both participants usually have both male and female gonads, so either individual can impregnate the other. And often, both individuals get impregnated from the same encounter. This is preceded by a kind of penis combat, although that's a really perhaps not the best word to use for it. In many species, this is a prolonged courtship stage. They will circle each other head to tail with their right sides and their genital pores facing their partner. They slowly approach, closer and closer, twisting around each other until they're lying next to each other, anti-parallel, so that the genital pores are in close proximity and they're in a complementary position. Now, the epiphallus feeds into a penis structure, which everts, or sprawls outward, seeking the genital pore of the other participant. This extruding portion of the penis structure is called a sarcobellum, which is used to stroke the mate, releasing chemical signals that have some unknown function, but presumably help to synchronize with, or label their mate during the ritual. Or perhaps it deposits some kind of aloe hormone that encourages the partner to keep participating in the mating ritual. Now, the epiphallus feeds into a penis structure, which everts, or sprawls outward, seeking the genital pore of the other participant. This extruding portion of the penis structure is called a sarcobellum, and it's used to stroke the mate releasing chemical signals that have some unknown function, 
but presumably to help synchronize with or label their mate during the ritual. Or perhaps it deposits some kind of aloe hormone that encourages the partner to continue participating in the mating ritual. If the species possesses love darts, which are like little knives hidden in a pouch in the genitals, both participants will also be extruding them and swinging and stabbing with it. This action is rather clumsy, as the gastropods don't have good vision, and they can't clearly see what they're stabbing at, and there's not really a whole lot of fine muscle control over this everted love dart appendage. It's also a, a rather strange juxtaposition against the otherwise loving, tender stroking performed by the sarcobellum. The love dart itself is coated in a chemical-rich mucus containing compounds that protect the sperm from the partner's immune system. So whoever can stab their partner, either first or at all, is more likely to end up impregnating their partner. When these mating gastropods are lined up close together, they'll begin using their mouths and their tentacles to feel out and stimulate the genital pore. This brief stage of oral sex involves a bit of sensual touching, maybe biting, and some head rolling or head swinging, which could be interpreted as pleasure, although it probably serves some other purpose. As a quick aside, I recently read a book called Metazoa by Peter Godfrey Smith. It was a short read, but really fun and really interesting. And one of the topics that he explores in the book is the inner lives of various so-called primitive animals in order to explore the uh, evolution and development of the mind and various forms of the brain and sensory structures and ways of perceiving and experiencing the world ar around the individual. One point he makes that is as surprising as it is delightfully interesting is that gastropods have surprisingly deep inner emotional lives. The emotional component of their neurology and their behavior and perhaps their lived existence is surprisingly deep for a mollusk or an invertebrate, or at least what we might assume of them. This is just one of several really fantastic examples from that book, so uh, if you want to check it out, I really recommend it. Anyway, at this point, when the genital pore of the partner has been identified, the penis will rapidly extrude, push into the partner's genital pore, and deposit sperm, or a spermatophore, into the vagina. Sometimes, the genital pores are lined up so well that when the penis is extruded, it goes directly into the genital pore of the partner, and you basically get this flawless, perfectly efficient insemination. Remember that the spermatophore is basically just sperm packaged into a jelly-like mass of goo in the epithallus. Once injected into the vagina, the sperm free themselves from the spermatophore, and travel up to a set of organs that receive and transfer them to the fertilization pouch, where egg and sperm can be conjoined. In cases of simultaneous reciprocal mating, each mate is a hermaphrodite who impregnates the other at the same time. But in hermaphrodite gastropods who do unilateral mating, they'll usually take turns impregnating each other, instead of doing it simultaneously. So this is what happens with internal fertilization which is common among terrestrial gastropods. Now, marine gastropods, which typically are male or female and not hermaphrodites, tend to use external fertilization, which is generally an easier method in the aquatic environment. The gametes are just released in big clouds, and there isn't as much preparatory mating behavior and searching out of the genital pores. There isn't really a need for a prolonged, intricate mating ritual. Now, what I've just explained here are just general broad strokes of the process. There is a ton of absolutely wild and super weird variation among species. For example, the hermaphrodite sea hares of the Aplaceidae are known to engage in sex chains, or linear orgies, where multiple individuals will all mate together, passing their sperm up the line to impregnate the one ahead of them, while being impregnated by the one behind them. The great gray slug Limax maximus does something extraordinarily strange. They'll climb up a tree, climb out on a branch, 
and then use a mucus strand, like a bungee cord, to dangle themselves in midair. The two dangling slugs will even evert their penises and mate right there, hanging a foot or two down from a tree branch, in open air. Why do they do this? It seems reckless and dangerous. They're so exposed. A hungry bird could come by and snatch them right out of the air. Why do they do it? No one knows. Other aspects of mating also vary between species, like the time spent with penis everted. Some species will only avert the penis briefly, while others will evert for longer periods of time. Some species will evert their penis and ejaculate the spermatophore not into the genital pore necessarily, but directly onto the extruded penis of their partner, which will then fold back up inside and bring the sperm with it. Some species will go back to the mating site and eat up any residual fluid, be it spermatophore goop or sarcobellum fluids, or even the common slime trails left behind as they move along the ground, or crawl over each other. It's rare, but in some species, when they're done with the mating process, they'll do something called apophallation, where they'll chew off their own penis, or they'll chew off their mate's penis, and it usually doesn't grow back. So in these species, mating tends to be a one-time deal. No matter how it happens, fertilization produces eggs, which are then laid or deposited somewhere safe. Within the egg, the gastropod embryo will develop and enter a trochophore stage. In some species, this trochophore stage will hatch and then, after some time living among the plankton, will turn into the more advanced veliger form. Most species, however, go through the trochophore form in the egg, and by the time they hatch, they're already in the veliger form. In both of these larval stages, the trochophore stage and the veliger stage, the gastropod is very small. Ecologically, it's just part of the plankton, and anatomically, it's hardly more than a small dot of visceral mass inside a soft shell with protruding cilia although it will rapidly grow many of the features seen in mature gastropods, like the foot muscle. Perhaps most importantly, the gastropod will undergo the torsion process in this late larval veliger stage. After living and growing as a plankton, the veliger will settle on the ocean floor and metamorphose into a juvenile, which is a process typically driven by exposure to chemical cues released by the prey of whichever gastropod species the veliger belongs to. Note that this is almost exclusively the case for aquatic gastropods. Almost all of the air-breathing gastropods go through the veliger stage in the egg as well, and by the time they hatch, they're already juveniles. The young gastropod juveniles will then mature into adulthood and begin mating on their own starting the life cycle over again. All right, I think this is a pretty good place to wrap things up. This has been episode 105 on the incredible weirdness of the gastropods. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something cool and mind-blowing. And I hope you'll hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It really helps us with the algorithm on a lot of these hosting platforms like YouTube and the Apple Store. And while you're at it, consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, or by checking out and buying something from the official store. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Oh.